Hello and welcome to Oxidative Stress Profile, a blueprint for longevity. My name is Adair Anderson. I am the clinical educator here at Vibrant. And before we get started, I wanna go over some housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them as a comment. There will be time at the end for Q&A and we'll answer all your questions at that time. Here's our agenda. First, I'll explain what exactly oxidative, the oxidative stress profile is. Then I'll make sure we're all on the same page by doing a detailed overview of oxidative stress. I'll share the markers along with the research vibrant scientists did to identify the markers. We'll do a deep dive on the damage markers specifically. I'll give you all the product details, and then we'll end with resources you can use to educate your clients about the oxidative stress profile, including which patients would benefit most from this test. And finally, I'll extend a special invitation to take your oxidative stress knowledge a step further, so stick around till the end. What is the oxidative stress profile? The Vibrant Oxidative Stress Profile is a test to identify and quantify your patient's levels of a large set of oxidative damage markers and to identify antioxidant genetic variations that can significantly impact their oxidative stress response. In other words, it combines genetic predisposition analysis with oxidative damage markers for in-depth insight into your patient's current oxidative stress load. When I say genetic predispositions, what I mean is, Based on your DNA, are your endogenous antioxidants working like they should to get rid of damaging free radicals? And when I say oxidative damage markers, what I mean is, are you eliminating oxidized DNA, RNA lipids, and or proteins in your urine? By identifying both genetic factors and current oxidative damage, the oxidative stress profile enables you to create individualized, proactive longevity plans for your patients that address their specific antioxidant needs reducing their oxidative stress and inflammation to slow aging and age-related conditions. The oxidative stress profile includes two panels, antioxidant genetics and the oxidative damage markers. The antioxidant genetic panel is an easy at-home saliva collection that uses RT-PCR to measure 32 single nucleotide polymorphisms impacting your oxidative stress load. The oxidative damage markers is an easy at-home urine collection test that uses LCMSMS to measure 16 markers of oxidative damage eliminated in urine. Why is this test so special? Well, Vibrant's oxidative stress profile is the only test that pairs markers of oxidative damage with genetic predisposition. It includes 16 markers of damage to four fundamental molecules, DNA, RNA, lipids, and proteins. As we'll discuss in more detail later, most other oxidative stress tests are only measuring damage to DNA and or lipids, but not RNA and definitely not proteins. This test also uses the gold standard methodolo methodology of LCMS-MS, Liquid chromatography with tandem mesh spectrometry is a powerful analytical technique that combines the separating power of liquid chromatography with the highly sensitive and selective mass analysis capability of triple quadrupole mass spectrometry. The oxidative stress profile also includes an oxidative damage score indicating your level of oxidative damage as it pertains to your age and compared to all age groups. And I'm super excited to show you what that one looks like. But first, overview of oxidative stress. What is oxidative stress? As the name implies, oxidative stress refers to when the body is in a state of stress or inflammation as a result of an imbalance between the generation and buildup of reactive oxygen species and the ability to eliminate these reactive byproducts through both innate biological systems and dietary antioxidants. Said another way, the oxidative stress occurs when the body is unable to keep up with the accumulation of ROS due to inadequate intake of antioxidants, poorly functioning endogenous antioxidants, and or a diet and lifestyle that just generates excessive reactive oxygen species. As illustrated on the left, it's possible to be genetically predisposed to oxidative stress due to unfortunate genetics, but protected by nutrient-dense diet and healthy lifestyle, such as getting ample sleep, managing stress, and getting regular moderate exercise. 
as illustrated on the right, it's also possible to have fully functioning endogenous antioxidants, but so many pro-oxidants in your diet and lifestyle that your body just can't keep up. These are things like smoking, drinking, alcohol, lack of exercise, or even excessive exercise. In other words, your genes aren't the only factor impacting oxidative stress. Like with so many chronic diseases, your diet and lifestyle choices can push you in the direction of health or the direction of dysfunction and disease. Okay, now that we've covered the big picture, let's dive into the details by asking the question, what are free radicals? Free radicals contain at least one oxygen atom and one or more unpaired electrons. Free radicals are reactive and therefore can interact with many important biological molecules, such as nucleic acids, lipids, proteins, and this causes irreversible damage. Free radicals as a group includes both reactive oxygen species like superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, as well as reactive nitrogen species such as nitrate and peroxynitrite. So what creates these ROS and RNS? Well, small quantities of ROS are formed during normal cellular processes, such as aerobic respiration. They're also created during inflammatory processes. For example, macrophages do produce ROS to help kill invading pathogens. Now, the body anticipates these first two sources and has the machinery in place to deal with it. It's usually the additional exposure to dietary and environmental oxidants, such as ultraviolet radiation, arsenic, atrazine, that tend to tip the scales in the direction of excess oxidative stress. But let's take a step back and really visualize each of these sources first. When I say normal cellular processes, what I mean is the process by which your mitochondria turn carbohydrates, fats, and protein into energy. You can think of your mitochondria like a car with an internal combustion engine. Every time you drive your car, the car takes oxygen, mixes it with the fuel, burns that fuel, and out of the tailpipe comes a little bit of water, some carbon dioxide, some energy that's propelling the car forward, but also some smoke and some soot. That's basically what mitochondria do too. They bring in food energy, mix it with oxygen inside the internal combustion engine of the mitochondria. They do produce some water, little, little carbon dioxide, which we breathe out some energy, which is the ATP that is the, you know, the fuel for all of our cells, but with it also comes some smoke and soot, which are those reactive oxygen species. What's a specific example of smoke and soot? Well, the reactive oxygen species superoxide. Superoxide is primarily generated by the electrons escaping from the electron transport chain complexes one and three. And in fact, you convert up to 4% of the oxygen you consume into superoxide which results in about one kilogram of ROS produced from cellular respiration each year. And the consequence is about 1,000 oxidative attacks on mitochondrial DNA per cell per day. It's well known that young and healthy mitochondria burn fuel cleaner than older and or damaged mitochondria. And this is the free radical theory of aging. As the mitochondria turn food into energy, they do create some ROS. Those ROS cause oxidative damage, which includes mutation to mitochondrial DNA. This leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, which drives aging. Then those aged mitochondria don't burn fuel as cleanly, producing more, more ROS and the cycle goes on and on and on. In short, aging causes a decline in mitochondrial function, which amplifies and per perpetuates the cycle. Key point here, oxidative stress is a fundamental pillar of aging. Number two, ROS are also created during inflammatory processes. As I mentioned before, innate immune cells produce ROS killing invading pathogens. When this happens, macrophages engulf or phagocytose, bacteria, viruses, or yeast. Then once encased in a phagosome, the macrophages release ROS, irreversibly oxidizing, thus damaging the cellular structures of those intruding pathogens. And this is a good thing. We want our innate immune system to be able to vanquish pathogens. So are free radicals always harmful? No, free radicals are not always harmful. Free radicals, ROS, are essential signaling molecules which are required to promote health and longevity. I think this graph shows the balance really well. If you have a little bit of oxidative stress recognized in the left as priming, it turns on the NRF2, which goes on to create a whole host of protective antioxidant enzymes like superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase. In other words, a little bit of stress means a good response. 
Now, if you have a little bit more oxidative stress, then you turn on NF-kappa B. And that's when inflammation really starts and takes place and you start to get tissue damage, et cetera. So this better get resolved or you're gonna end up with a really long-term problem and production of even more oxidative stress. If you have a lot more oxidative stress than you can handle, let's call this extreme, then you send the apoptose, apoptosis signal to your cells and they commit program cell death. In other words, the dose really makes the poison here. So that brings up the question, what causes higher levels of oxidative stress than our bodies can handle? Well, it's the exposure to dietary and environmental oxidants. This includes too many calories, when you overeat, you're essentially flooding the engine, right? What happens when you're following a car that's getting way more fuel uh, than oxygen? Well, you see a big black cloud of smoke coming up the tailpipe. Also hyperglycemia, just having a big spike in your blood sugar is gonna immediately damage the endothelium via the glycocalyx. If you've never heard of the glycocalyx before, check out the webinar Dr. Jeffrey Gladden presented in February titled, Optimizing Cardiac Health to Live Young for a Lifetime. Another thing that causes excess ROS is cigarette smoke. It's full of mitochondrial poisons like carbon dioxide and cyanide. Alcohol is also a big driver of ROS as it impairs liver biotransformation, leading to more toxic intermediates. Also, UV radiation from the sun and just toxins in general, be it from ionizing radiation from nuclear waste, environmental toxins, or heavy metals. If you've read our Heavy Metals Interpretive Guide, you know that heavy metals are a major source of free radical formation and that mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and lead can directly create reactive oxygen species. If you wanna take a deeper dive, check out this review on heavy metal pollution in the environment and their toxicological effects on humans. On page four, the authors state, metal toxicity causes formation of free radicals, which cause DNA damage and lipid peroxidation. Here's a graphic outlining major endogenous and exogenous sources of ROS. Endogenous means they're made within the body, such as the metabolism, the inflammation we talked about. Exogenous means they originate outside the body, such as cigarette smoke, UV radiation, environmental toxins, and medications the body must remove through detoxification pathways. This slide also outlines oxidative damage markers created by ROS damaging your lipids, DNA, RNA, and proteins, but we will cover this in more detail later. Okay, now that we've covered ROS, let's talk about antioxidants. What do you think of when you hear the word antioxidant? You may think of vitamins A, C, and E, perhaps polyphenols like red resveratrol from grapes or EGCG from green tea. But antioxidants don't just come from plant sources. Your body makes antioxidants. In fact, you have a whole fleet of antioxidant enzymes with free radical scavenging abilities. You may be familiar with the master antioxidant glutathione, but there are many others, including enzymes like superoxide dismutase, catalase, glutathione S transferase, glutathione peroxidase, and thioredoxin. Now, some of these antioxidants work by donating an electron, typically a hydrogen molecule, to quench free radicals. Others are involved in reducing it, reducing, aka recycling those electron donating enzymes so they can be used over and over again. For example, glutathione readily gives up an electron, in this case a hydrogen molecule, to neutralize hydrogen peroxide. Note that it takes two glutathione because hydrogen peroxide has two reactive oxygen molecules. And also, after giving away their hydrogen, the pair of glutathione become balanced again by bonding to each other via their cysteine sulfur atom. So 2GSH becomes 1GSSG. Here's another way to think about it. Pretend that the two glutathione are a mom and a dad, and that the hydrogen is like candy. Mom and dad are holding candy in their hand. Hydrogen peroxide, on the other hand, is a toddler having a temper tantrum. The toddler is tired, hungry, and about to just run down the grocery store, pulling food off the aisles and causing a scene. To prevent this from happening, mom and dad both give their candy to the toddler. Now, the toddler's sitting there, candy in both hands, munching on it, happy as a clam. And mom and dad decide to hold hands to celebrate the near disaster. So when mom and dad no longer have candy, that's not so great because in order to be prepared for the next temper, temper tantrum, they need to get some more. So similarly, oxidized glutathione, GSSG, must be recycled before it can be used again. 
This is done via the enzyme glutathione reductase, which requires electron donation from NADPH+. In this equation, two NADPH each give a hydrogen candy so that mom and dad can both have candy again. Consider the transfer of electrons, hydrogen, from NADPH through the thyroid oxygen system. It's like a game of hot potato with electron candy. Essentially, hydrogens are being passed from one molecule to the next molecule, to the next molecule, to the next molecule, until it finally neutralizes that free radical. In this way, the thyroid oxygen system really recycles antioxidant enzymes so they can be continually used to donate electrons to neutralize free radicals and protect your body from oxidative damage. Another way to think about this is rust. Like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, oxidative stress makes your body rust from the inside. Iron plus oxygen is iron oxide, irreversible. Once you have it, it's hard to get rid of it. And when you have too much rust in the body, things just stop working properly. Here's an overview of your antioxidant defense system. We're gonna walk through some of these key reactions now to get a closer look. Starting at the top, superoxide radical produced by your mitochondria can readily act upon polyunsaturated fatty acids in your cell membranes, turning them into peroxyl radicals and eventually into lipid hydroperoxide. This is bad. It's like sticky, stinky oil baked into your old cookie sheets, superoxide can really make your cell membranes rancid, which is why your body naturally produces superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase turns superoxide into hydrogen peroxide. But of course, hydrogen peroxide isn't good either. Remember, it's sometimes used to disinfect wounds, bubbling as it kills. What's worse is that hydrogen peroxide can also get turned to hydroxyl radicals via Fenton reactions, which is when your hydrogen peroxide reacts with iron or copper. And this is why you have two, not just one, but two enzymes to turn hydrogen peroxide into water, and that's catalase and glutathione peroxidase. Catalase requires iron or manganese as a cofactor, and as you just learned, the glutathione peroxidase requires glutathione as a cofactor. Of course, once oxidized to GSSG, glutathione is recycled to glutathione reductase back into the reduced glutathione, GSH. Recycling glutathione is crucial because it's not just used to neutralize hydrogen peroxide. It also helps with biotransformation in the liver. In the liver, glutathione S-transferase, or GST, adds glutathione to xenobiotics like herbicides, pesticides, volatile organic compounds, resulting in glutathione conjugates so that they can be eliminated from the body. And in this case, glutathione does not get recycled, but literally eliminated from the body bound to the toxin. If you want a refresher on liver biotransformation and glutathione conjugation, check out the YouTube video on the screen. In the video, I explain why we need water-soluble compounds like glutathione to help remove fat-soluble toxins like atrazine from the body. So now that we've reviewed key antioxidants, let's take a look at all the SNPs, the oxidative stress profile measures, as well as oxidative damage markers created when there's too much oxidative stress in the body. The oxidative stress profile includes 32 single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs to provide insight on how well your endogenous antioxidants are functioning. You probably recognize a few of these, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, and the thyroid oxygen system. Note that some enzymes have more than one SNP ID, but all 32 SNPs across all 17 enzymes are crucial to neutralizing oxidative stress, be it by directly quenching a free radical or helping to recycle the endogenous antioxidants. I wanna mention there is some overlap between the toxins genetics test that Vibrant launched last fall and the antioxidants genetics panel. They both include SNPs related to detoxification pathways, and this makes sense. The reason heavy metals, mycotoxin, and environmental toxins are so dangerous is because they form ROS in the body. So if you can't get them out of the body through liver or biotransformation and detoxification, they just keep causing damage. Taking a deeper dive into just genetics here, you can see that Vibrant's oxidative stress genetics test is more robust than competitors. Looking at the rightmost column, Competitor 2 has a test with over 157 SNPs, but only six of those, highlighted in bold, are specific to oxidative stress. Looking at the middle columns, Competitor 1 has a detoxification-specific test, and while their test is over 21 SNPs, only seven of those are specific to oxidative stress. 
Said another way, we're the only company offering a genetic test specifically for oxidative stress. Additionally, note the lower cost of our antioxidant genetics test compared to our competitors' more generalized genetics testing. Why pay more money for fewer antioxidant-specific SNPs when you can get more antioxidant genetic markers for less? The oxidative stress profile also includes 16 oxidative damage markers. This includes five markers of lipid peroxidation, like malondialdehyde or MTA, four hydroxynonanol, and five two isoprostanes. It includes three markers of DNA and RNA damage, including 8-OHDG. And note that all the markers of DNA and RNA damage have guanine or guanosine in their name. It includes three markers of protein oxidation, including dityrosine, bromo, and chlorotyrosine. Three nitrogen stress biomarkers, and two advanced glycation end products, carboxymethylysine CML and carboxyethylysine CEL. Transitioning to just the oxidative damage markers, you can see that Vibrant's oxidative damage markers test includes 16 analytes, which is more robust than our competitors. I also want to point out here that we have markers in four fundamental molecules. We're looking at DNA, RNA, lipids, and proteins. Most other oxidative stress tests only look at the DNA marker 8-OHDG and or the lipid markers F2 isoprostane or lipid peroxides. As you know, protein is more abundant in the body than DNA, right? Because DNA makes your proteins. So that category, protein, takes the biggest hit. The fact that other labs are missing those markers means they're missing out on a huge category of oxidative damage markers. Changing gears, I want to share just how cool Vibrant is. While creating the new oxidative stress profile, Vibrant's R&D team read hundreds of scientific studies to learn which specific SNPs impact your oxidative stress and which specific damage markers are the best indicators of oxidative stress to your DNA, RNA, protein, and lipids. Then, since they'd already done the work, they decided to write and submit a review article on the topic. The article is currently in preprint, meaning it has not yet been peer-reviewed, but it is available for viewing. I recommend reading at least the abstract, which states, while direct quantification of oxidative species in the body would be ideal for assessing oxidative stress, it is not feasible owing to their high reactivity, short lifespan, and quantification challenges using conventional techniques. Instead, oxidative damage products pose as appropriate markers indicating the degree of oxidative stress in the body, and effective quantification of those markers may improve our understanding of the phenomenon, which may aid in maintaining cellular integrity, preventing age-associated diseases, and thereby promoting optimal well-being and longevity. Since damage markers are new for almost everyone, let's spend a few minutes taking a deep dive into some of these damage markers now. Markers of DNA and RNA damage are listed here, and let's take a deeper dive into 8-OHDG. You may already be familiar with this marker as it's part of Vibrant's urinary hormones test. As you know, DNA is made of four nucleotides, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And of the four, guanine is the most prone to oxidation. When a hydroxyl group, OH, is added to the eighth position of guanine, it results in the formation of 8 hydroxydeoxyguanosine, or 8-OHDG for short. Think of it as rusty DNA. Now, when your DNA repair enzymes find 8-OHDG, and yes, your body can repair DNA, the repair enzymes replace the 8-OHDG with regular guanine, and the 8-OHDG is excreted in the urine, which is where we can measure it. Numerous articles indicate that urinary 8-OHDG is not only a biomarker of generalized cellular oxidative stress, but may also be a risk factor for cancer, atherosclerosis, and diabetes. If you want an overview of using 8-OHDG as a marker of oxidative stress to DNA, check out this review article. If you want to take a deeper dive into all the reactions that eventually produce 8-OHDG, including a great graphic, check out this article from 2009. Moving on to markers of lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation is when free radicals attack polyunsaturated fatty acids like EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid. 
As you know, the double bonds in polyunsaturated fatty acids are sites of weakness susceptible to oxidation. This is why dietitian nutritionists recommend keeping nut seeds and oils rich in polyunsaturated fats, such as flax seeds, walnuts, soybean oil, in the fridge or freezer, or to at least keep them away from heat and light, i.e. not on top of your stove where they're likely to turn rancid. When arachidonic acid is attacked by free radicals, it undergoes peroxidation to form isoprostane, such as 8-isoprostaglandin F2-alpha. When we measure F2 isoprostanes in your urine, it means you have rancid fats on your body. If you want to take a deeper dive into exactly how arachidonic acid gets turned into isoprostanes, including this great flow chart, check out the article from 2005. If you want an overview of using isoprostanes as a marker of oxidative stress to lipids, check out this review article. If you want to learn how macrophages eating oxidized LDL produces ROS that drive production of F2 isoprostane, read the article on the left. And if you want evidence that lipid peroxidation products in the vasculature that don't arise directly from LDL can also contribute to atherogenesis, check out the article on the right. And yes, you heard me correctly, F2 isoprostanes are shown to be the starting point of atherosclerosis. Malandialdehyde, or MDA, is another marker of lipid peroxidation. As I, measured in the, as I mentioned in the beginning, Vibrant uses liquid chromatography mass spectrometry for quantitative detection of damage markers in urine samples. LCMSMS is a highly accurate methodology able to identify the exact molecule. In contrast, competitors often use T-bars, thiobarbituric acid reactive substance. This method identifies multiple types of aldehydes. So while it does give an approximate level of, L of MDA, it's not specific to MDA. Also, the article cited here points out that this method is subject to interferences, thus less accurate. Markers of protein oxidation. The most well-known disease associated with protein oxidation is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the presence of extracellular amyloid plaques and neural fibrillary tangles in the brain. Research affirms that the underlying factor in neurological disorders is increased oxidative stress, substantiated by the findings that protein side chains are modified either directly by oxidative species or reactive nitrogen species. Dityrosine is one of these protein modifications. As the name suggests, di meaning two, tyrosine is two tyrosines stuck together. In other words, oxidative stress causes your proteins to clump together. If you want to take a deeper dive into how tyrosines get stuck together, check out this 2023 article, Dityrosine Crosslinking and Its Potential Roles in Alzheimer's Disease. And note that dityrosine is abbreviated DIY because the one letter symbol for tyrosine is Y. Nitrogen stress markers. In order to talk about nitrogen stress, we get to revisit DNA. As you remember, guanine is one of four nucleotides. In contrast, guanosine is a nucleoside made of guanine plus the sugar, ribose. Each DNA strand has a backbone made of alternating sugar, deoxyribose, and phosphate groups. And eight nitroguanine is formed when guanine, guanosine, and or two deoxyguanosine are attacked by reactive nitrogen species like peroxine nitrite. If you want to learn more about how excess production of reactive nitrogen species can cause nitrative and oxidative damage to DNA proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, check out this article here. I also want to share this article on accumulation of 8 nitroguanine in human stomach cells caused by Helicobacter pylori infection. Since the level of 8 nitroguanine is higher in the gastric epithelium of patients with H. pylori infection than those without infection, the authors suggest that nitrositive and oxidative DNA damage in the stomach epithelial cells caused by H. pylori infection may be a useful indicator for the risk of gastric cancer development. And finally, advanced glycation end products. Advanced glycation end products or AGEs are formed when proteins or lipids become non-enzymatically glycated after exposure to sugars. You've probably heard of the Maillard reaction where sugars and amino acids get stuck together during the heating process, creating delicious caramelized flavors. For example, when you take the amino acid lysine and heat it next to glucose, you get fructose lysine. However, when you add a dash of oxidative stress to fructose lysine, it turns into a dangerous advanced glycation product called carboxymethyllysine or CML for short. 
CML is one of the most commonly measured and well-described advanced glycation in products. So we've talked a lot about the damage markers. Let's find out if elevated damage markers correlate with any diseases or conditions. Spoiler alert, yes, they do. This study showed that e-cigarette users have elevated 8-OHDG, which is DNA, and F2 isoprostane, so lipid damage. These studies show Alzheimer's patients have elevated 8-OHDG and 8-hydroxyguanosine, so DNA damage, for HNE, MDA, and isoprostane, so also some lipid damage, as well as 3-nitrotyrosine, indicating nitrative stress. These studies show how people with hyperlipidemia have elevated F2 isoprostane and dityrosine, which is damage to both lipids and proteins. And these studies provide evidence that folks with diabetes have elevated 8-OHDG, so DNA, CML, which is the advanced glycation end product, and 8-isoprostane, so limit, lipid damage as well. All right, are you ready to see what the report looks like? Let's dive in. The report will include four sections, the oxidative stress summary, which includes a flow chart, the antioxidant genetic, which indicates your patient's variant versus the reference allele, the oxidative damage marker with values plotted on a scale so you can visually see how high or low your patient's oxidative damage is, and finally, the oxidative damage score. Now, we're gonna take a deep dive in each section, but before I do, I want to address the thought you're probably thinking. Hmm, this report looks a lot different than other vibrant reports I've seen. And that's because it is. We're in the process of updating all our reports, displaying analytes graphically, including flowcharts when appropriate. For example, the organic acids and urinary hormones tests are getting huge updates and making them way easier to read. And you are some of the first to know about this exciting new thing. Okay, back to oxidative stress. The summary will include a free radical flow chart, and hopefully this looks familiar. This flow chart will populate with your patient's actual results and indicate in red if they have genetic variations negatively impacting their pathway. Specifically, the high-risk variants cause the enzymes to not work optimally, so the flow does not happen. And when the flow does not happen, you have patients who experience increased oxidative stress. Starting at the top, Free radicals can form soluble extracellular toxins if glutathione extransferase and glutathione aren't working properly. This patient has a variant in their glutathione gene that results in lower glutathione levels. And without adequate glutathione, their glutathione extransferase doesn't work as well, setting them up for, setting them up for more soluble extracellular toxins. When free radicals create superoxide, that superoxide can create lipid radicals and intermediates. Having adequate glutathione is helpful for this too. Remember that this patient has lower glutathione levels due, their, due to their GSH. And to add insult to injury, this patient also has impairment to their glutathione peroxidase enzyme, GPX. So even if there was enough glutathione around, they aren't able to use it to neutralize these lipid radicals. Going on the left side of the flow chart, superoxide can also get turned into hydrogen peroxide by superoxide dismutase. There are three types of SOD, and good news, all three of this patient's superoxide dismutase are working, so they're likely creating lots and lots of hydrogen peroxide. Unfortunately, hydrogen peroxide, as we mentioned earlier, is not a great thing to have in the body, which is why we do have those two enzymes to turn it into water, catalase and glutathione peroxidase. Bad news for this patient though, oh, both their catalase and glutathione peroxidase are impaired. Thus, this patient has a very difficult time converting hydrogen peroxide into water, which means even more oxidative stress. Listed below the flow chart, you'll see the number of SNP variants. To review, this patient has one of one SNP for GSH, making them susceptible to lower glutathione levels. They also have two of three SNPs for catalase, indicating increased risk of mitochondrial dysfunction, and two of four SNPs for glutathione peroxidase, making them at risk for aberrant redox signaling and elevated ROX production. The full report includes a complete list of the genetics markers measured in the panel. Elevated risk associated variants are indicated with red. 
partially elevated risk associated variants are indicated with yellow and alleles with no risk are indicated with green. In this example, CYP1A1 and GLU, GLUL and GSS are homozygous variants, so have elevated red risk. Glutathione peroxidase is heterozygous, which gives partially elevated orange risk. Meanwhile, catalase, PRK, AA2 are homozygous wild type, indicating these enzymes should be working optimally. The antioxidant genetic summary provides detailed information about each SNP with elevated risk, so you can learn what exactly isn't working optimally in the body. Each oxidative damage marker will be reported numerically with the reference range and also plotted on a scale so you can visually see how much free radical damage is occurring to your DNA, RNA, lipids, and proteins. In this example, there is very little damage to 15R and 8 isoprostaglandins and very little damage to MDA, malandialdehyde. However, oxidative damage to 11 beta prostaglandin is low moderate and damage to 8 hydroxynonanol is high moderate. We also see elevated red level damage to the DNA marker 8-OHDG, and it's gotten worse over time. The dark blue pan reflects the current result, and the light blue pan reflects the previous result. Each oxidative marker summary also provides detailed information about each damage marker with elevated risk. You can learn what's likely contributing to the oxidative damage. Last but not least, let's take a closer look at that oxidative damage score. The x-axis is your age, the y-axis is your oxidative damage score, and this graphical representation of the overall oxidative damage score is calculated using the results from all 16 urine damage markers tested. It's applied to a linear regression model and displayed with respect to your age group. The score in green represents a normal score based on the 50th percentile population. A score in the yellow represents a moderate score falling between the 50th and 90th percentile and a score in the red represents a high score compared to the relatively healthy population. In this example, the patient is currently 35 years old and has an oxidative stress score above the 90th percentile, correlating with an oxidative damage score of about 63. Looking at the lighter blue pin, their previous result indicated that when they were 34 years old, they had an oxidative stress score well into the 90th percentile, correlating with an oxidative damage score of about 80. In other words, this patient, after getting their initial results, made significant changes to their diet and lifestyle to lower their oxidative damage score from 80 to 63 over the course of just one year. This example illustrates how the oxidative stress profile can help guide providers and motivate patients to make dietary and lifestyle changes to lower their oxidative stress and to slow aging. So which patients would benefit most from this test? Well, anyone who has increased oxidative stress due to their diet and lifestyle. Patients who have toxins, heavy metals, environmental toxins, exposure to ionizing radiation, patients eating too many calories, patients with hyperglycemia, patients who smoke cigarettes, patients who drink alcohol, patients who spend time in the sun. Basically, everyone can benefit and particularly patients who are already headed away from optimal health towards the disease side of the spectrum. How can we easily determine where someone's at on the spectrum? By asking them the following question. On a scale of zero to 10, how is your level of wellness? Zero means you cannot function, cannot get out of bed, and 10 being perfect, vibrant, effortless health. Anyone who's at a nine or below could benefit from knowing their oxidative damage and risk for oxidative damage. In fact, a patient who knows they have crappy genes are more likely to eat a better diet and lessen their total toxic burden to help reduce the ROS load on their endogenous enzymes and to help their endogenous enzymes work better. Remember, oxidative stress is a fundamental pillar of aging. So anyone who is aging, anyone who wants to live younger, longer, anyone focused on longevity would benefit from the oxidative stress profile. All right, let's cover some logistical details, specifically collection instructions and methodology. Antioxidant genetics is a DNA test. We are collecting DNA from saliva. So the collection is an easy saliva specimen tube. 
Patients should rinse their mouth with water to remove food residue and wait at least 10 minutes after rinsing to avoid sample dilution before collecting a saliva sample. Uh, fasting is not required for DNA testing, and there are no medication or supplement restrictions since your DNA doesn't change. However, patients should avoid foods that are high in sugar or acidic or high, or high caffeine content immediately before sample collection. So for best performance, avoid eating a meal within minutes of sample collection. The Vibrant Antioxidant Genetics Panel uses real-time PCR methodology. DNA is extracted and purified from saliva samples, and a SNP genotyping assay is performed using real-time PCR to detect specific allele targets of each assay performed. We're basically producing millions to billions of copies of specific segments of the DNA, which can then be studied in greater detail. We use a PCR machine, and it is quite accurate. Oxidative damage markers are eliminated from the body in the urine. So the oxidative damage markers test is a simple at-home urine collection. We do want patients collecting first thing in the morning, their first morning void, as this will have the most concentrated level of damaged products. Patients should not drink more than eight ounces of water. One hour prior to urine collection, the samples may be rejected if the urine is too dilute. Fasting is not required for this test and there are no diet or medication restrictions. However, patients should stop supplements and exercise one day prior as this will give more baseline oxidative damage. Taking antioxidant supplements like vitamins A, C, and E may cause falsely low damage markers by quenching the RLS. And exercise may cause false highs because most exercise does increase your RLS production. The Vibrant Oxidative Damage Markers Panel uses tandem mass spectrometry methodology, LCMSMS, for quantitative detection of damage markers in urine samples. Urine creatinine is measured using a kinetic calorimetric assay based on the Jaffe model, and all damage markers are reported as the quantitative result normalized to urine creatinine to account for urine dilution variations. So all results are normalized to urine creatinine. And again, LCMSMS is the gold standard for determining analytes in urine. The turnaround time for this test is only 10 days, and the specimen st stability for both blood and urine is seven days from the date of collection. Finally, here are resources you can use to tell your clients and patients about this new test. Here's the patient one pager. Here's the markers list. Here are the key clinical messages. The sample report. And the interpretive guide is coming soon. And now for that special invitation I alluded to at the start of the presentation. We are also hosting an oxidative stress boot camp featuring our very own Dr. Kim Bruno and guest speakers, Dr. Jason, Jason Chen and Dr. Jennifer Stagg. It starts in two weeks on Thursday, March 28th and lasts for six weeks. All boot camp sessions will be at 1 p.m. Eastern time, which is 10 a.m. Pacific time. And everyone who has registered will get a copy of the recording, so it's okay if you miss a session or two. If you want to take your education a step further and take a deeper dive into oxidative stress, you can get a free test while learning about the test. And it only costs $350. We're basically paying you to learn about the oxidative stress profile. Sign up now using the QR code. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Please let us know if you have any questions.